Have your Bibles. I want to call your attention to Luke's Gospel, chapter 14. <clears throat> hey, my. The Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 14. <clears throat> and I'd like to have preached something else this afternoon, but I could not get away from this chapter. Luke's Gospel, chapter 14, and we'll begin reading with verse 1. And it came to pass as he went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees to eat bread on the Sabbath day <clears throat> that they watched him. And behold, there was a certain man before him which had the dropsy. And Jesus answering spake unto the lawyers and Pharisees, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? They held their peace. And he took him and healed him and let him go and answered them, saying, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fall into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? And they could not answer him again to these things. And he put forth a parable to those which were bidden when he marked how they chose out the chief rooms, saying unto them, When thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, Sit not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come and say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin with shame to take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room, that when he that bade thee cometh, he may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of them that sit at meat with thee. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Then said he also to him that bade him, When thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends nor thy brethren, neither thy kinsmen nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made thee. But when thou makest a feast, Call the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and thou shalt be blessed, for they cannot recompense thee, for thou shalt be recompensed at the resurrection of the just. And when one of them that sat at meat with him heard these things, he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then said he unto him, A certain man made a great supper and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, Come, for all things are now ready. And they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I've bought a piece of ground, and I must no needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. Another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the streets and lanes of the city, and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges, and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And there went great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower setteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king? Going to make war against another king, setteth not down first, and consulteth whether he be able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand. Or else, while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an embassage 
and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. In this portion of scripture <clears throat> that we've read in your hearing this afternoon, I note in the 28th verse that he speaks of counting the cost. This chapter deals with two <clears throat> subjects. One is the marriage supper, and the other is discipleship. They're inseparable. There are those that are endeavoring to separate them. Many are interested in the marriage supper. They're interested in heaven, but they have little concern about discipleship. But if we're going to be in that number when the saints go marching in, we're going to have to be disciples of our Lord. <clears throat> Verses 26 and 27 and 33, Jesus talks about disciples. I didn't say it. He said they cannot be my disciple. Webster tells us that disciple means a learner, an adherent, an imitator. I suppose 500 years ago, possibly, I'm not sure, there was a man by the name of Thomas Kempis wrote the book, The Imitation of Christ. John Wesley was influenced by that book. But what he was saying when he said the imitation of Christ, he was talking about discipleship. For discipleship means an imitator. It's a high honor. It's a chief honor to be a follower of the Lamb. Wouldn't it have been interesting to observe as Jesus walked the seashore that day and found those fellows cleaning their nets? Interesting to some find someone cleaning their own nets, but get off of that. But they were cleaning their nets, and he called to them and said, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. The scripture says they dropped their nets and followed him. He showed himself many, many, many ways that our Lord showed himself. Uh, after his resurrection, I read in the 20th chapter of John, he showed them his hands. In the 20th chapter, in the 31st verse, I read where it says that he wrought many signs uh, in their presence. Uh, that was in the presence of the disciples. In the 21st chapter uh, and uh, the 21st verse, uh, the scripture tells us that this is now the third time that he showed himself. But back in the 11th chapter of Matthew, back before the crucifixion, back uh, when he was instructing and teaching and preaching, he said, learn of me. He said, I'm meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest. Uh, but he also said in those verses, he said, learn of me. What is that? That's discipleship. Now, I want to say this afternoon, it costs something. It costs something to be a disciple. Not everyone willing to meet the requirements. But in the opening verses, we find that <clears throat> as Jesus went into the house of one of the chief Pharisees uh, that, uh, to eat bread on the Sabbath day, that they watched him. Did you ever feel someone's eyes on you? <laughs> I mean, they, that, uh, oh, that scrutinizing look, I can imagine. And uh, he, uh, you remember, healed the individual. We read about that. He stopped them. They didn't have any answer. When he asked them if they had an animal that fell into the pit on the Sabbath day, wouldn't they pull it out? Amen. And the sixth verse says they could not answer him of these things. And then he went on and he began to talk about chief rooms, chief seats. Amen. Isn't it interesting? Isn't it interesting? He says in that 11th verse, my what? Tremendous instruction. He says, For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. I heard about the fellow that they give him a medal because he was so humble. He began to wear it and they took it away from him. <laughs> again and again, the scripture talks about humble yourself. That's something that God wants us to do, but if we don't do it, He'll find a way to do it. 
I think of a fellow by the name of Haman, and of course he had didn't he wasn't a follower, he wasn't a disciple by any means, but God humbled him, didn't he? Oh, he built that scaffold, and he intended for that fellow, that Jewish fellow, to hang on that scaffold. But God turned those circumstances around, and brother, I mean, God humbled him, didn't he? God has ways of bringing the mighty down. Oh, yeah. Jesus said, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. But then he goes on, and, and uh, he, he has a subject that he's endeavoring uh, to teach these disciples. Uh, I've read a tract since I've been here on the campground, a good tract by Harold Wills, um, uh, about uh, are, we, are you a Pharisee or something that, to that effect. There were good Pharisees. There were Pharisees that I'm sure that made up the early church. Uh, there were those that really wanted to follow the Lamb. And I'm sure that Jesus was doing everything that he could uh, to get it across to these chief rulers, these ones that were the religious leaders of the day, to try and get them uh, uh, to get on the right side of this thing, to become disciples and be eligible for the marriage supper of the Lamb. And so he talks to them in that 12th verse. And he's literally saying in that 12th verse, he's saying, uh, don't be clicky. He said, when thou makest a dinner or a supper, call not thy friends, nor thy brethren, nor thy kinsmen, nor thy rich neighbors, lest they also bid thee again, and a recompense be made unto thee. How long has it been since you just simply invited someone in from the outside world, someone that didn't fit either dress-wise or any otherwise, but you got them in under the sound of the gospel, the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. He's not saying that we couldn't have fellowship, no. One of the greatest things in the Christian way is to have fellowship with friends. And we, wife and I and my little girl, have enjoyed it here at Stoneboro. Uh, and we enjoy fellowship. Uh, but let me tell you, dear one, this discipleship means that we move out into a lost world out there where there's the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind. And they may be well off as far as this world's goods are concerned, but they're poor as far as eternity is concerned. Amen. Oh, but there are those that seem to have the attitude that they'll just, their wives and John and his wife and Harry and his wife and the rest of the world can go as far as they're concerned. Don't be clicky. You pardon this illustration, but I mentioned last night the passing of Kathy Johnson. Kathy Johnson Purdom, Brother Spencer Johnson's 27-year-old girl, the bloom of health, mother of two lovely little children. But they lived, she and her husband, little boys, they lived in a trailer park. Nice area. And at the funeral, I don't know how many couples, Brother Fuller, young couples were at that funeral. I saw young ladies. They had necklaces. They had ear bobbed. They had all the signs. They stood and wept like their heart would break. They said that Kathy was our friend. She came to our house. Uh, she'd bring fresh baked bread that she'd just baked. She'd come over. She In the services, when a newcomer came in, she walked up and said, I'm Kathy Purdom. So happy to have you in the service. Amen. We're talking about, I'm talking about discipleship. Oh, there's a social side to this business, dear one. If, if we're going to have friends, the, the, the wise man said we're going to have to show ourselves friendly. Amen. Jesus here, he said, don't be clicky. Oh, what a tremendous opportunity this Allegheny connection has uh, in this section and all across the sections as far as that's concerned. I know your man out uh, in Sacramento, in fact, his name is Brother Man, uh, and I understand how God is blessing and helping him to reach out uh, in that wicked area, that uh, state of California. But let me tell you, dear one, uh, that's what he's advised us to do. Uh, he says, don't be clicky. He said, this supper that has been prepared. This supper that was completed when Jesus cried from Golgotha's rugged brow, it is finished, it's prepared, it's ready. And he said, call not thy friends, thy brethren, thy kinsmen, thy rich neighbors. Oh, those are to be included. But he's talking about that one down on the other side of the track, possibly. 
the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind. Call them that can't recompense you. Amen. So he says, uh, don't be clicky. He tells who to call. And he talks about in the 14th verse, he said, you'll get your recompense. Oh, this high interest that, that folks that's got a few funds are receiving, these uh, uh, CDs and so forth, but they don't hold a candle to what God has promised those that will serve him. Why, he said we'll receive a hundredfold out there. Brother, that beats 16 and a half percent, all hollow. A hundredfold, he said. Amen. Oh, he talking about, talking about discipleship. But I noticed that there was one that caught it. In that 15th verse, I don't know whether he was a lawyer or a Pharisee, but in the 15th verse it says, One of them that sat at meat with him heard these things. And he said unto him, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. That will be blessed. Brother, I'll tell you, it be the greatest thing we can imagine to be there at the marriage supper of the Lamb. To break bread with our Lord. To be able to look upon Him and fellowship and be with Him. To escape the troubles and the problems and the heartaches and the heartbreaks of this old world. To be there where there's no more pain and no more sorrow and no more death and no more heartache and no more heartbreak and no more separation. Oh, dear one, it'll be wonderful, won't it? But notice, all he caught was just the part about the marriage supper. He didn't catch that part about the discipleship. And so Jesus comes right back. He comes back at the same subject. And he tells about the supper that was prepared. That's what he talked about down here. He said, when you call your neighbors and so forth and, and uh, to supper. But here he comes right back, reiterating what he'd already told. He wanted this fellow, this lawyer, this Pharisee, whatever it was, to catch the message. And he told about the servant at supper time that went out and called. And those that were bidden called them to come for all things are now ready. I'm glad there doesn't need to be any new revelation. It's all here right now. The gospel's in full bloom tonight. There's a fountain open in the house of David. Whosoever will can plunge in and be made every whit whole. Amen. It's all ready. But they all, notice, they all, with one consent, they're from different walks of life. They were from different stratas of society, but they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground. I must needs go and see it. I pray thee, have me excuse. Well, he'd already bought it. It surely was off the market. The realtor couldn't offer to anyone else. He would bought it. Why couldn't he let it lay for a little while? And go and take care of this most important bit. Dear one, God isn't disappointed if we can lay up a few dollars in the bank. If we can have a few possessions. But I'll tell you, it causes the tears I'm sure to flow. If we put our heart in the bank. Amen. Oh, do you have your possessions or do your possessions have you? Amen. He said, I bought some land and I've got to go prove it. Now they said, I've got some, I bought some oxen. Same thing. He'd already bought them. They was off the market. Looked like he could have let them stand there in the corral while he took care of this business. But he said, I pray thee have me excused. Now they said, I've married a wife. And therefore I can't make it. And so the servant came and showed his Lord. And I'll tell you, the scripture says, the master was angry. Oh, dear one, he's trying to get through to this fellow back here that said, Blessed is he that shall eat bread in the resurrection. Brother, that'll be blessed. But I'm telling you, there's something between now and the resurrection. We're not saved to just sit down and enjoy this business. We're not saved to just become a, a number on the roll. Oh, no, we're to do something. Uh, we're responsible to give the gospel in the same measure as we have received it. Say, well, I don't have any talent. I don't have any ability. We can do something. We can do something. One of our, one of our, our missionaries, and they don't, know, they don't know yet, down in, in South America, some way a track, a part of a track, a piece of a track, got way out on a jungle trail, just about 30 miles as the crow flies from that area where that Jonestown tragedy took place. 
And there was a there was a young man, an Indian, that was walking that trail, and he saw that piece of paper and he picked it up. And it had just just a few words of the gospel story on one side, and then it had the name and the address of one of our missionaries on the other side. They don't have any idea how that little piece of, just a little scrap of paper got to that trail miles and miles and miles from where our missionary was. But that fellow read just a few words and his heart was pricked. And he began to call and finally found someone who was a sister to one of the members of his tribe that was a member of one of our churches and it took months but there was finally a connection made and our missionary made his way out there and found a whole a whole a village that was hungry for the gospel just one little piece of a track and it's happened again and again and again across the uh, periods of history and yet some folks they never think about handing out a track am i in Oh, yes. Why, you say, that's a preacher's job. Wait a minute. Brother, we all can be disciples. He intends for us to be disciples. Brother, he wants to see us saved and sanctified and the sin question settled. But we're not to just sit out on the stool of do nothing. Brother, we're to be lights to a lost world. Amen. I'll tell you, there's laymen, their lives uh, reflect the glory of God and thrill my heart and thrill my life. They don't have any special call, but I'll tell you, they're exemplifying Jesus Christ by their life and by their walk and by their talk. Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, well, notice Jesus was angry. Oh, yes. I read one place where he got a rope and drove some fellas out, said, My house shall be called a house of prayer. You made it a den of thieves. But here the scripture says, Then the master of the house, being angry, said to his servant, Go out quickly in the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. Years ago, by the W.M. Tidwell, pastor in Chattanooga First Church of the Nazarene, he pastored for 42 years. And in the war... There was some fellow that was head of a big company, and he shipped him down from, I believe, the New York area, down to Chattanooga. W.M. Tidwell gathered in every little urchin, every little boy, every little girl he could possibly get in. He didn't care how ragged their clothes were. He did everything he could, brother, to get them all in. They were welcome. Amen. Brother, I tell you, you don't know what that little freckle face, that little freckle face, ornery little boy that can't sit still, you don't know what might be wrapped up in that life if you just exemplify Jesus Christ and have a little patience and do your best to get him in. And this fellow, brother, he was cultured. You know what? culture is about nine times out of ten it's whitewash for a rascal <laughs> I don't know whether it's in that case but anyway that fella brother he was troubled and bothered by all of the riffraff he called it the riffraff and one day on the way out from service he said to brother Tidwell he said we need to get rid of some of the riffraff around here brother that stirred that Scotchman he came right back and said we may get rid of you but we're going to keep the riffraff Amen. Oh, brother, I tell you, I like to see him got in. I like to do everything I can to possibly bring in that little old fellow off the street I told you about, William Gale, on the streets of North Platte, Nebraska, a freckle-faced boy and so ornery, and I've heard him tell a little bit about how they just nearly didn't let him back into school the last time. Brother, there's something wrapped up in that, in that fellow's life. Oh, yes. I believe they're out there. I believe they're out there. What are you talking about this morning, this afternoon, preacher? I'm talking about discipleship. Amen. The marriage supper, it may be closer than we think, but he hasn't come yet. And his instructions, his orders are to occupy until I come. Amen. Oh, yes. Uh, we're saved to try and let our light shine to a lost and a dying world. Uh, but... There's a lot of folks that their interest wrapped up in their possessions. Amen. I own so many acres. I have an automobile and I have it paid for. Bless your heart, I wished I had mine paid for. Amen. But let me tell you, the only thing you really own is your soul. 
If you die this afternoon, I don't care. You have every penny paid on that car out there. But if you die this afternoon, someone else will drive it away from this campground. You may own a home. You may have it all paid for. May have the deed. Everything's all taken care of. But if you die, somebody else will be living in your place. But the only thing we really own is our soul. Oh, yeah. But a lot of folks, their interest is all wrapped up in their possessions. And then he goes on and talks about uh, livelihood. That's those, uh, those uh, oxen that he bought. Livelihood. Some folks are workaholics. They'll just work, 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 work. From daylight to dark, come into prayer meeting and get adjusted good and go fast asleep. While the preacher who has spent time trying to find something to feed them on Wednesday night. And brother, they get comfortable. It's not long till they get that, that dazed look, you know. Amen. Oh, yeah. I know right where I am this afternoon. Brother, I've been there and seen that look. Come on. That lock eye. Foy Bullock calls it the lock eye. He said there's a lot of folk uh, that get that in the afternoon. Heard Harold Schmuel talk about, and he's preaching down Hope Sound last February, and he said, uh, he said uh, the Bible said, uh, he giveth his beloved sleep. He said, how many are on your way? <laughs> oh, yes. <clears throat> but uh, livelihood. What is that? Well, you say, preacher, I've got to make a living. Would you give me the verse, please, the, the scripture? I haven't found it, and I've read this thing through more than once. I've never found where we have to make a living. I do read where we have to die. Amen. You ever hear of J.C. Penney? Old J.C. Penney. We've been, we go nearly every time we go home, we go through Kemner, Wyoming. There's that old mother store, that number one store. That's where he started out. That's where he went flat broke and started over again. But J.C. Penney, I don't know that he's ever a member of a wholeness church. But you know what J.C. Penney said? And incidentally, his stores never stayed open until J.C. Penney no longer had control of the company. I mean on Sunday. Brother, they closed on Sunday. I remember when they opened in our area, I wrote a letter. I asked, asked the store. I found out they were going to open the thing on Sunday. Big mall. I went and found the fellow that was in charge. I said, can you tell me who's in charge? And he finally, he finally gave me the director's name out in Portland, Oregon. And I wrote him. He wrote me back. And he said, well, he said, we're sorry, Reverend. But he said, uh, uh, it's your church people that keep it open. I wrote him a second letter. I said, there's none of my church people that's keeping your store open. If they are, they'll not be members of my church very long. But J.C. Penney said, are you listening? J.C. Penney said, if we have so much business that we can't be in Sunday school on Sunday morning and worship service Sunday morning and service Sunday night and prayer meeting on Wednesday night, he said, we've got more business than God Almighty intended for us to have. Well, that's good preaching. Hey, Amen. That's what J.C. Penney said. Oh, yes. Livelihood. Said, I bought five yoke ops. I got to check them out. And then that domestic bliss. Oh, those silken cords. There's multitudes of men that are in hell because their wives wouldn't pay the price and they didn't have the intestinal fortitude to go on anyway. Hey, Amen. Oh, yes. That 23rd verse. Then the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. For I say unto you that none of those men, the landowner, the oxen owner, the fellow that was all wrapped up in, in domestic bliss, he said, They'll not taste of my supper. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Serious words. Then the 25th verse, the 26th verse, notice, no, the 25th verse, he said, and there went great multitudes with him. Brother, that impresses some folks, doesn't it? I mean the multitudes. Brother Manziel, I had a fellow tell me a while back, said, my, we like your services. We like your folk, but said, your church is so small. <laughs> Amen. Why, where, God, where the Lord is, where the Spirit of the Lord, if there's just two or three, it's a wonderful place. Hey, Amen. Oh, yeah, great multitude. That impresses some folk, but that doesn't impress the Master. Brother, he turned and laid down some conditions. And when the conditions are laid down, the crowd always becomes smaller. 
Did you ever notice that? When you lay the conditions down, there's some folks that say bye-bye. Amen. And there's a lot of folk go with them. It was Saul. You turn over there and read that chapter where he forced himself. You read how many times the word people is found in there. The people. But they were going this way and going that way. And Saul lost sight of God and got his eyes on the people. And he finally forced himself. That's why folks that one time would never have thought of trespassing into some territory that they're treading without fear today. But they're doing it because they lost sight of him. And they got their eyes on the people. I read in that 26th chapter of Acts where, where the Lord told Paul, he said, delivering thee from the people. And he got delivered. He started churches all over the known world. But when he come down to the end of the trail, he said, no man stood with me. He's all alone. But old Paul had his chin set and his face set just like he started out. But he said, the Lord stood with me. Amen. I'd rather have the Lord stand with me if everyone forsakes me. Amen. Well, he, he laid down some conditions. He said, uh, he said uh, in the 26th verse, uh, he turned to them in the 25th verse uh, and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not. Now then, that doesn't convey the, the meaning that, uh, that we think of it. Doesn't mean you're to hate your father. That's contrary to Scripture. What he means is the respect for your father, the love for your father will be on this level, but your respect for God, your love for God will be up here. In other words, you love your father less than you love God. Did you ever read where Jesus said he didn't come to bring peace? He said, but to bring division. He said the father against the son and the mother against the daughter. Amen. We don't read that scripture too much, do we? We really don't pay too much attention to some of that scripture. That just, it just seemed like it, it, we, we, it just, it just a little too close almost. But that's what he said. And brother, I found out when we really go with God. Brother, I'll tell you, there's kinfolk. There's loved ones. Say goodbye. Goodbye. And there's a lot of folk aren't going because they're holding on to father and mother and brother and sister, and son, and daughter, and so on. Oh, my. You know what he said? He said, he cannot be my disciple. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Where are you this afternoon? Where are you in relationship to father, and mother, and brother, and sister? I was in a revival in, in Grand Junction, Colorado. I'd received a letter. Broke my heart nearly. My mother wrote me. She died in 1964. This was in 1964. And she'd written me and said, Son, never see you anymore. Never see you. Said, I'm getting up in years. I was out in the evangelistic field then. Was for about 10 years. Said, never get to see you. We was in revival in Grand Junction, Colorado. And just as the service closed, a policeman stepped through the door. And I, my heart skipped a beat. And he was asking for... Lowell Foster and I went to him and there was the message to call and I got on the phone as soon as I could and my brother said mother suffered a stroke and we I never left a meeting before in my life but I felt like I'd ought to and we hooked onto our old 35 foot trailer and headed out but somewhere between Grand Junction and Scotts Bluff, Nebraska mother crossed the line of worlds but Christians Never meet for the last time. <laughs> There's going to be a reunion one of these days. And we'll have plenty of time to be together. But now we've got other business. Amen. We're talking about, I'm talking about discipleship this afternoon. Talking about the marriage supper. Going to be glorious. I want to be there. It'll be blessed. But right now my interest is all wrapped up in discipleship. Brother, I'm going to take an inventory ever so often. He said in that 26th verse, he said he cannot be my disciple. Just one illustration, I'll go on. Just a year ago this next month, September, I was in revival in Greenburg, Indiana. <clears throat> and there was a young couple, cultured young couple, successful. Oh my. And some of our folk had got acquainted with them and they'd gone after them. And I mean, that church was doing everything they could to encompass the salvation of that young couple. 
the groundwork had been ra made when the revival started. There's some folks get excited in revival, and then they forget all about it between revival. You've got to lay groundwork if you're going to have revival. When you when a revival closes, I mean when the ser when the series of services ceases, it's time to start in again to build towards the next revival. Sometimes the only one that does it's the preacher, but if the let he just get busy. But I mean this crowd had been busy. And brother, they'd gone after that young couple. And I'll never forget that Sunday morning. God was all over the place. I closed my message and made the invitation and started down the aisle to a fellow on my right that his wife was whispering to him. First time he'd been in the service and I went and talked to him and urged him to come to the altar. He rejected his wife and rejected my entreaty. Just across the aisle was this young couple. And I'm careful about going, especially when folks are, are new. I, I don't know, brother, there needs to be wisdom there. The Holy Ghost has to lead us to just go bustering up to some folk. I've seen them leave and never come back. Oh, the Spirit can lead us. But this was a case. This was there. I started back down towards the pulpit, and the Lord checked me and said, I want you to go back and talk to them. And I turned around and walked back to them. I shook hands with him and then shook hands with her. And I said, I'm so happy to have you folk in the service. I said my name, I told them my name and they told me theirs and we visited right there in the, in the invitation while they were singing. While some had already come to the altar. I just bit, and then I said, would you folk like to pray? Brother, she came out of that seat, like to run over me. And I mean they both, and he followed her right down to the altar and they prayed. I didn't feel too clear about her. But that old boy struck oil that morning. He prayed clear through. Every once in a while, the pastor would call. We'd visit back and forth. We're friends. And uh, I'd ask about the new couple. Oh, he said, they're doing great. Said he especially said, she's not doing as well as he is. Said, pray for him. I said, you tell him hello for me and that I'm a praying for him. And then one day the phone call came. And the pastor said, oh, Brother Foster <laughs> said he came to my study last Saturday. And he wept like a baby. But he said, he said, my daddy, when I was five years old, said my daddy walked off and left my mother and we children. And he said, I vowed as a little boy that if I ever got married, if I ever got married, I'd do everything in my power to keep my home together. And the preacher said my wife has told me said it's been coming on for weeks uh, said she's tried to keep it from the church crowd but said my wife told me this morning said make up your mind it's either me or that church what she was really saying it's either me or Jesus is what she's really saying and he said preacher he said I love my wife and I love my home but he said I love Jesus but he wound up going with his wife what are you talking about? Said, I've married a wife. Said, therefore, I cannot accept the invitation. Oh, I don't have any idea who I'm preaching to this morning, this afternoon. That's one thing I appreciate about this crowd. There's not been one word. Brother Manziel never even suggested anything to me. I appreciate that. Amen. I preached under the leadership, and I believe Brother Paul West has preached under the leadership of the Holy Ghost in this camp. Amen. Oh, we talking about talking about discipleship. I don't know who might be in trouble this afternoon, but I want to say, I want to say that after discipleship, there's the marriage supper, if we're faithful. Amen. But it didn't only say it in the twenty sixth verse, but he also said it in the in the twenty seventh verse. He said in that twenty seventh verse, he said, "And whosoever doth not bear his cross, what is that?" Does that mean teaching a Sunday school class? No, teaching a Sunday school class is not bearing a cross. Being Sunday school superintendent, that's not bearing a cross. It's a sight what some folk have in their mind as far as crosses are concerned. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Adam Clark says of this verse, he who is not ready after my example to suffer death in the cause of my religion is not worthy of me, does not deserve to be called my disciple. We're talking about preacher. I'm talking about discipleship. 
talking about the marriage supper. I'm not talking about a banquet. I'm talking about discipleship. I'm talking about the marriage supper. I heard a while back about a captain that put a young missionary couple off on a faraway island. And as they was unloading their baggage, that captain spoke to that young man and said, Young man, said, you know, you'll die here. It was long before they had the medical uh, supplies they have now. Said, you'll die here. Said, why, there's fever on those islands. And said, there's men that would as soon kill you as look at you. Said that missionary, looked that captain in the eye and said, Captain, we died before we left. Amen. Oh, I'm glad we can die to some things. I'm glad we can get some things settled. And then I see folks stumble over little 25 cent things that don't amount to a hill of beans. We had a fellow out in our country a while back that was battling over a mustache. And he finally got courage enough to get a hold of a razor. And you know when he got to shaving that thing off, he found that the roots of it went clear down to his heart. <laughs> hey, man. I sent him at the altar just squall and bawl, brother. I thought there's something as big as a as a as a Holstein bull. Something surely there, there's something, brother. I mean it's major. And then when it came out, why well, I've been so shocked I nearly fell over. Of course the devil doesn't care. He doesn't care at all. I read where one fella lost his birthright over just a bowl of soup. You say little thing don't make any difference. I read where God checked one crowd out on how they drank water. Hey man, we talking about talking about discipleship this afternoon, brothers. Obedience in this business. Oh yes, take up your cross and follow me. Praise His wonderful name. Oh, I read over in Matthew the fifth chapter where it talks about the adversary. He said, "Agree with thine adversary quickly." Who is our adversary? Well, I believe it's the same thing that he's talking about here in this case. <clears throat> Who served does not bear his cross and come after me. He cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counteth the cost whether he hath sufficient, sufficient to finish it. Amen. A lot of folk hit the altar and all it is is emotion. They don't put any willpower into it. Don't put any backbone into it. No determination. Amen. Oh, yes. Out in Burns, Oregon. I never go through Burns, Oregon. Out in the middle of Oregon, state of Oregon. And then there's a little suburb or something, I guess, called Haynes, Oregon. They border together. And off to the left, as you're driving on Highway 20 or Highway 26, both, there's a big old two-story concrete part of a building. Doesn't have any roof. Never did have a roof. The windows... They were formed and the concrete poured around them. They've never had a window sash in them, never been a glass in them. It just stands there. And way back after World War I, there's a fellow put everything he had into building a big hotel. And he got that far. And that's as far as he got. And it's a monument to a fellow that started to build. But he didn't count the cost. And he didn't finish. There's a lot of folk... They don't have concrete structures, but they started. They started to build, but they weren't able to finish because they didn't count the cost. It's going to cost something. You say, what'll it cost, preacher? Cost everything. Amen. I read on where uh, it says uh, in, the, uh, in the 31st verse, what king going to make war against another king? And he wakes up to the fact that that other king has him outnumbered two to one. 20,000 against his 10,000. And brother, he begins to do some calculations. Who's he talking about here? He's talking about our adversary. We're up against an adversary. Who is that adversary? God. We're never going to win the conflict. The only way in the world we can win is to submit, to surrender. Unconditional surrender. I had a buddy back in in Nebraska that was in the United States Navy and he's on board the USS Missouri when Doug MacArthur escorted those Japanese on board that vessel. I've been on board the vessel. They, they've, got a, they've got a brass plate 
on the very spot where peace, unconditional surrender. And this friend of mine said, he was standing at attention. He said, I was standing so close that when that Japanese officer bent over to sign that paper, his sword in its sheath stuck out. He said, I could have reached down and grabbed it. But let me tell you, it was unconditional surrender. Brother, I mean, they had, they had nothing to do with writing any part of that contract. It was unconditional. And I want you to know that God has an unconditional contract. And the amazing thing of it is, why you, you just stop and think how prosperous the Japanese became under the wise counsel and leadership of Doug MacArthur. But let me tell you, we've got one that's got a contract for us. But brother, I'll tell you, he'll be so much better to us than a man that Doug MacArthur could ever have been to the Japanese. But how many folk are holding back? Some little old something that doesn't amount to a hill of bean, but they just hold on to it. Amen. I've seen them. I've watched them. I've stood in amazement. Amen. Little things. Oh, my. That, uh, I was reading the other day, Brother Carroll uh, referred to Stephen. I was thinking the other day about the, the deadly sin of garment guarding the deadly sin of garment guarding amen why Saul of Tarsus he didn't throw any stones oh I got your attention now don't I now I'm just about through I'm just about to turn you loose but he could stand so pious he could have testified in court I never touched a rock I never threw any stones I'm all clear but they stacked their coats, their garments at his feet. The deadly sin of garment guarding. Amen. We talking about? I'm talking about discipleship. Brother, I'll tell you, discipleship does not include the effort on our part to down someone around through circles that we set up. And we stand off so pious while all of a sudden someone puts the knife in somebody's back and we, oh, who would have thought it? The deadly sin of garment guard. Oh, there's preaching up that stream, but I don't have time to, to go up that stream. I, I'd like to. It seemed like I've preached in that area along that line so much in this camp more than I want to. I got to thinking about Jesus the other day. Well, Jesus knows everything. He knew everything when he walked the, the paths of earth. You know that? He knew what Judas was doing. Are you listening? He knew exactly what Ju Judas was doing. But he never broke his mind to Peter. Brother, I mean, if he'd have just handed to Peter what Judas, had done, what Judas was doing, I mean, Judas would have lost more than an ear. Brother, that big fisherman would have taken care of the traitor before he had a chance to take care of Jesus. Over the heads of some folks. Oh, I've had them come. You don't know what they do to me. You don't know how they've treated me. Oh, poor me. No one knew. They came to that last supper and Jesus said, He that dippeth has betrayed me. Brother, the look of shock all up and down that table. Lord, is it I? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Are you listening? You say, well, they told me I had to tell it. Do you have to tell everything? There's a lot of things if we'd keep to ourselves, brother. I'll tell you, the old chariot would be a long ways up the road to where it is tonight, today. Oh, yes, little tales and little circumstances and little conditions and so forth. If we had just kept our mouths shut, there'd be folks that would have kept their confidence, would have kept their prayers a-going. But when they heard that little tidbit, well, they begin to turn and they begin to wonder, could it be? Amen. Deadly sin of garment guarding. We're talking about, talking about discipleship. Amen. 
Oh, this discipleship includes the Sabbath day. I haven't got around to that. I'll just touch on that a little bit this afternoon. The Lord's day, you know. Keeping the Lord's day. Amen. I only went hunting one time on Sunday. I was just a teenager. And I tell you, I thought all the time, surely that gun will backfire or something will happen and I'll get killed and I was so miserable. Brother, I mean, my parents drilled into me that Sunday was the Lord's day. Never did go fishing on Sunday. Whether I love to fish and love to hunt, I can't find too much wrong with it if you keep it in this proper place. But I want you to know that Sunday's the Lord's day. It's a different day. It's a day to worship God. The old newspaper boy, he passes on by 3219 East Eustick. He didn't pitch the Idaho statesman out on our lawn. Oh, man. You say, well, he doesn't pitch the Idaho statesman out on my lawn either, but does he pitch something from Pennsylvania out on your lawn? <laughs> Amen. I heard about a fellow that was walking down the street, and he had seven coins in his pocket. And he saw a beggar, and that beggar was so pitiful. And that fellow's heart just went out to him, and he pulled those seven coins out and selected six of them and gave them to that beggar. And put just one back in his pocket. And he went on. He's a feeling so good. That beggar pocketed those six coins. Secured himself a club. Followed that fella. And hit him over the head. And took the seventh coin. Oh, you say, what a rascal. What a, what a, what a, what a beast. What a brute. Wait a minute. God gives us six days. You listening? God gives us six days to take care of our business. And then that seventh day, why, I see folk out mowing their lawns on Sunday. I see them cutting their hay on Sunday. I see them doing all kinds of things on Sunday. You say they're breaking the Sabbath. No, they're just, you, can't break the, they're, you can't break the commandments. You can break your neck, but you can't break the commandments. Brother, the commandments will be here when you and I are gone. God said, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Amen. What about traveling on the Sabbath day? Oh, dear Lord, I'm going to, I've got to keep it going. I've ruined myself already, but maybe I can redeem myself just a little bit if I finish up here and quit. I heard about years ago down in Kentucky that a fellow drove along in an old Model T, and he came, he came on a field that had about 40, had, I, 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 no, it was 40 acre field, and it was just filled with horses. And he stopped his car and just looked at all those horses out there. And finally he saw a boy and he called to the boy and he said, Son, he said, what are all those horses? And the boy said, oh, he said, those are out of the mines. Well, he said, he said, I don't understand. They're all, oh, he said, they bring them up once a week. He said they found out if they don't bring those horses out of the mine once a week, they go blind. Hey, Amen. Well, that didn't register, so we'll, we'll go on to another one. <clears throat> the last that I want to mention, verse 33. He said, so likewise, he cannot. Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Could I ask you a question in closing this afternoon? Whose terms are you living on? Are you living on your terms? Or are you living on his terms? I read about a fellow in the panhandle of Texas by the name of Jim Ragsdale. And he came into a little church. He was as white as death. Testimony meeting time came and he stood up in that little church. And the folk incidentally were shocked to see him. They'd never seen him in their church before or any other church for that matter. But he stood up in this little church and he said this. He said, I've lived here. 43 years. You all know me. I told many of you my religion was to be a good moral man, a good neighbor. But when the doctor told me I had three months to live, I found out my idea of religion wasn't good enough. I began to pray. He asked for everything, and I gave it to him, and I'm happy today. Amen. Three times, three times in this 14th chapter of Luke, Jesus said, he cannot be my disciple. Oh, dear one, 
But I want to say and just close with this illustration. Brother, there's a plus to it. Oh, there's joy unspeakable and full of glory. I'd rather be sold out to him. I'd rather be in his charge. I'd rather be under his constitution than anywhere else or any place else in this world. Amen. Why, Shellhammer wrote, while place we seek or place we shun, the soul finds happiness in none. But with my God to guide my way, tis equal joy to go or stay. Heard about the little Salvation Army last day. She's only about 16 years old. Her cheeks was as red as if she'd put the reddest rouge on that the, that the 10 cent store sells. She didn't. It was cold and her cheeks were rosy. And she was on that street corner and just a preaching for all she is worth. Quite a crowd had assembled. And a big old Anglican bishop come bustling through the crowd. Got right up against her. Just stopped her. I mean, just, just bullied right up to her. Looked down at her with disdain. And he said, hmm. Said, I don't suppose you can say the Lord's Prayer in Latin. And brother, she blushed clear to the roots of her hair. And she looked down for a moment, but then she looked back up and she said, No, sir, but pardon me, sir. Can you say you're saved and sanctified in English? <laughs> and brother, I mean, it wasn't long till the bishop was heading off down the sidewalk. Oh, I'm so glad that we can get it settled to where we know, we know, we know to whom we belong and where we're headed. Praise his wonderful name. All right, let's stand. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for your presence. We're thankful, Lord, for the wonderful service this morning. We pray, O oh God, that you'll anoint by the Paul West with that unction from on high tonight. Bless the fullers, Lord, how we've enjoyed their singing. Bless them as they select the songs for tonight. We pray, Lord, that between now and the night service, there'll be those prayers that'll go up that are so needful and necessary. No, oh, God, sweep in and give us total victory around this place tonight. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.